We're going to read a few verses, and then we're going to stand to pray to change your position. Now, we're not going to preach on this, but we're going to use the text tonight uh, to preach, and we promise not to be too long. In Acts chapter 16, Acts chapter 16, you remember the story of the jailer who was wonderfully converted under the ministry of Paul, uh, Paul the Apostle. And whenever Paul had prayed with Silas, the prison was shaken, and then the old prisoner, uh, the old jailer shook. And the Bible says that in verse uh, 28 of uh, Acts 16, Paul said, he cried with a loud voice saying, do thyself no harm, for we are all here. Then the, the prisoner or the jailer called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Amen. And we know God will bless the public reading of his word. Let's stand and unite in prayer for a moment, and that'll change your position, give you a rest for a moment. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the testimony of your saving and keeping power and the ongoing work of the Holy Spirit in a life that is yielded to Christ. And we pray now, Lord, for the help of the Holy Spirit to proclaim your word. I acknowledge, Lord, without you I can do nothing. And I depend completely on God, the Holy Spirit, to take the word of God and apply it to all who listen. So, Lord, we pray a hedge round about us. We ask, Lord, that your presence and power would be present. And we pray for souls to be saved, for backsliders to be restored, and for your people to be built up in their most holy faith. We take authority over every influence of darkness in Jesus' name, and we pray that Christ will be exalted in our midst. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. You may be seated. In the light of Ian's testimony tonight, I want to ask the question, how can I be saved? How can I be saved? It may be that you're here tonight, or perhaps you're listening online. And so I want to be as simple and plain as I can in presenting the truth of the Word of God. How can I be saved? There was this man in a jail where Paul met him, and God had sent an earthquake, and as a result of the earthquake, the man thought the prisoners had all run away and he was going to take his own life and commit suicide. But Paul, recognizing what was happening, jumped in and said to him, don't do that because we're, we're all here. We're, none of us have run away. And the man was so frightened by what God had done in bringing the earthquake. He knew that God had done it. And he came trembling and shaking before them. And he said, what must I do to be saved? That was a great question. In fact, it was the best question any man or woman, boy or girl could ever ask. What must I do to be saved? Well, let me point out to you, first of all, what it means to be saved. A friend of mine who had been a very devout Roman Catholic was telling me the story after he became a Christian. He was witnessing to one of his friends who also had been a devout Roman Catholic. And this gentleman got converted and was following the Lord, and he met his friend, and he was talking to him. And they were talking as they were walking along, and he said, I've got saved recently. And his friend, being a Roman Catholic, didn't understand what he was talking about, and he said, did you fall into the river? He said, no, I didn't fall into the river. He said, God saved me, not from the river, but from my sin. And you see, the Bible says in the book of Isaiah... God speaks to people like you and I, and he says, look unto me, 
and be ye saved, all ye ends of the earth. For I am God, and there is none else. Then in the book of Acts, the Bible says, Neither is there salvation in any other. For there is no other name under heaven given amongst men whereby we must be saved. Jesus said, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. This man then said, what have I to do to be saved? I want to tell you that there's absolutely nothing you can do yourself to be saved. If you're ever to be in heaven, and I hope you are, it will certainly be through nothing that you have done, through nothing you have accomplished, through nothing you have worked or striven or labored with. You see, friends, the Bible says in the book of John, when he, the Holy Spirit, has come, that's him coming to earth, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. You see, before you can become a Christian, God must do something in your life. God desires to do it, and I trust that he is doing it in either you in the meeting tonight or in others who are listening. Ian referred to it. He talked about two or three years where he didn't know which end of them was up, where he felt that he was in depression, and he was to discover when he heard the gospel that the problem was conviction of sin. The Holy Spirit had begun to work in his heart. And if that doesn't happen, then you can't become a Christian. You see, salvation is of the Lord. It's not of man. The Bible says, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. There are some people that believe, you know, I'm going to grow up, I know I need to be saved, but I'm going to do my own thing. And I have ambitions, and God's not part of it. And boy, when I get away from church and religion and all the stuff that mom and dad have, boy, when I get free of all that, I'll get life to the full. And then before I die, what I'll do is I'll just call on God and God will save me and I'll be in heaven and I'll have got the best of both worlds. You think like that? I remember when we first got the telephone in my home when we were children. And the phone came and my niece was in the home and she was quite small, and one day I listened, and she walked into the kitchen and lifted the phone. She said, hello, yes, how are you? And she talked away, and I went in and said to her, you know, Pat, there's nobody on the phone, and she said, shh, and she talked, yes, yes, that's right. I said, Pat, there's nobody on the phone, and she got really angry, and she banged the phone down, and she says, how did you know there was nobody on the phone? I said, it didn't ring. It didn't ring. You can only get saved when God rings. My spirit shall not always strive with man, God said, before the great flood came and after it. God said, you'll not always have opportunity. You see, my friend, you are dependent on God for salvation. He's not dependent on you. We live in a day whenever man's the big fellow, capital M, and God's the wee fellow with a wee G. But it's not like that. 
man's never the big fellow. Because man in his best state, the Bible says, is altogether vanity. He's nothing. So you're dependent on God. And friends, whenever the Holy Spirit comes to a man or woman, he convicts them, the Bible says. Another word is to reprove. Now, what does that mean, Alan, when you say that the Holy Spirit comes to me and convicts me? What does that actually mean? Talk in a language I can understand. All right, what it means is to show you that you're guilty before God. That's what the Holy Spirit does. He convinces you with solid, condemning, and compelling evidence that you are guilty before God and heaven. That's what he does. He brings you and I to the light. You see, friends, it's like Whenever you go out, if you ever saw sheep, I'm sure most of us have saw sheep, and some of us maybe owned them. And you look out at the sheep on a spring day, and the grass is growing, and the sheep are walking about, and you see these wee white dots all on the green field. And they're white. And then a snowstorm comes, and when the snow falls down, on the green field and the snow is so white and you look out the next day and you see these wee grey black dots they're not white anymore because you see the white has shown them not to be white and that's what happens my friend when the Holy Spirit comes and brings the purity of heaven and the purity of the Creator In line with us, it's like the snow falling on the green field and suddenly the sheep aren't clean at all. In fact, they're very dirty. And that's how God sees you and I. And so when the Holy Spirit convicts us of sin, what happens is God brings before us guilt. Guilt. And guilt is the greatest problem in the lives of men and women. Guilt. They carry it. They carry it. And it's real, my friend. I spoke recently to a man who came to my home and he told me about a close relative who had murdered some people, prominent people, during the Troubles. One of his relatives. And he told me all about what had happened and how these prominent people back in the 80s were murdered by this relative of his. And he said, you know, whenever I was young, all the boys used to come in in Belfast and they used to say about him, oh, he was the boy, he he, he done them in. And he said, my relative was quite pleased with himself. But he said as he got older, whenever we come in and chatted, he used to say, you know, I'm going to hell. I'm going to hell. Where did that come from? Guilt. Guilt. Then he said as time went on, he began to ask, do you think God could forgive me? for the things that I did 30 years ago. Mm. Ah, you say, Alan, but I didn't commit any murders. Maybe not. But the Bible, my friends, has something to say about guilt. And before Adam, the first created being, created in God's image, when Adam sinned before any children were born, the Bible says, whenever the Lord came to the garden, Adam hid, and he said, I was afraid. Guilt had set in, sin had come. The Bible says, there is none that understandeth. 
There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. When Paul was writing to the Galatians that great thesis on justification by faith, writing to the Galatian churches, he says, but the scripture hath concluded all under sin. Then Isaiah, the great prophet, said, but we are all as an unclean thing and all our righteousnesses are filthy rags. I was just reading that recently in my Bible, and I noticed when I looked up the filthy rags, it speaks of w- rags that are covered with, with filth and dirt, some it's excrement, and he said that's what all our righteousness, that means people who try to be good, who are religious people, they try to be good to get to heaven and keep rules. God says all that is just like clothing with excrement on it. Do you imagine coming into this presence of God like that? No, my friend, God takes that all away and he gives you freely the righteousness of Christ. A new white robe he places freely on you because of what Jesus did for you and me on the cross. All our righteousnesses are filthy rags. The Bible says, for all have sinned and come far short of the glory of God. Oh, how far short of God's glory. You see, friends, God presents through the Scripture that man is brought before him, and tonight I want to bring you into God's courtroom for a few moments. And I want to put you in the dock. And God is the judge. And I want to see how you'll do in the dock because God has all the evidence about your life. He has every thought you ever thought. He has every word you ever spoke. He has every hidden and secret thing ever done. He has it all. It's all evidence. How will you fare in God's courtroom? What about whenever you have told a lie? Oh, you say, but it's only a fib. Oh, there's no fibs with God, my friend. To lie is to bear false witness, which is to break the Lord's commandments. How many of us have not stolen, even at school, when we lifted a little thing, didn't belong to us, and we wanted it and took it, we stole. We're thieves. We're thieves. God's courtroom. Oh, and as we have looked at the opposite sex, and there we have looked with lust and uncleanness in our heart and committed adultery in the heart, God says, you're judged, you're guilty of the deed. My friend, we could go on, you hate somebody. God says, you're guilty of murder in his sight. And so we go on and on with the commandments of God and we bring the light of heaven to bear on humanity and we bring the law of God in upon you and blow after blow comes. Guilty, 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 guilty. The Bible says that the whole world is guilty before God. See, my dear friends, Some people respond to that by saying, I'm not too bad. (laughs) I'm not too bad. I try. I go to church. I give sometimes to the poor. I help my neighbors. I'm good to my mom and dad. I'm sure some of you have brought your cars through the MOT. You know what it's like. It's a thorough test. Well, imagine if you went to the MOT and you had the car all polished. And you decided, I'm going to put on two new wiper blades. And when I put the wipers on, boy, will it be clean. You say, I'm going to put this in. And you put her in through the test. And then they lift the bonnet. 
And then they open the doors and they get in under her and they start pulling at the brakes and they shake and rattle. Do you almost wonder when you're watching them, will I have a car by the time they're finished with this? If you have one of your wipers done, when you go through at the end, those who haven't done it, you'll learn it. You go through and you watch them carefully and they come over and they have a big long sheet and that big long sheet says, Field. Field. It doesn't matter what you've done. And there are many people and they try to overcome their guilt and their shame and their sin by good works. But the Bible says, by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works lest any man should boast. The Bible says it's entirely by faith in Jesus Christ alone that you can become a Christian, not by religion. You often hear people saying, I go to so and such and such a church. I'm a Christian. Well, if you went to McDonald's, would that make you a beef burger? Of course not. But why is it that if you go into a church building that that makes you a Christian? Sure, it's ridiculous. It doesn't even make logic. My friends, to be a Christian, Christ must be in your heart and spirit. God must come to live inside you. And when he does, you know he's there. You know he's there. You say, well, what's the effect of this conviction alm when it's happening. Well, it's different for different people. In a child, it can be very simple. A child can simply believe the word of God and recognize my children came to Christ, all of them, three, four, five, or six. Oh, yes, you can come to Christ as a child, a little one. And the younger you come, the better. But sometimes we can live lives that are either religious or irreligious, whatever it might be. But my dear friends, when the Holy Spirit convicts you, well, what happens is just what happened on the day of Pentecost when the gospel was preached for the first time. And what was preached by the apostle Peter, when he preached, the Bible says that the people were pricked in their heart. They were cut to the heart. It brought pain. And my dear friends, it brought a troubling into them. And that's what happens when a man or woman is convicted of sin. They are troubled. And they're troubled about particular issues, as Ian alluded to tonight. Eternity, heaven, hell, my sin, judgment, meeting God. Those are the things that the Holy Ghost will bring to the heart of the person. And every mother and father and every person who's a Christian in this church, that's what you should be praying for your family. And even if they're backsliders, pray to that end that the Holy Ghost will bring conviction of sin upon them. That they'll turn to God. I remember many years ago doing a mission in Balamina. And this particular man had been prayed for much by his mother and his father, but especially his mother. And he came into the meeting and ran in. It was really, I happened to be the preacher. It was other men knew how to pray. And boy, the benefits of that praying brought some power into that mission, I can tell you. But I remember going into the back room with that man. And he was a real hardened sinner. And he was a boy that was on the periphery uh, to some extent of the paramilitaries. And he wasn't really that nice a character. But he came into the back room and I can tell you I didn't mind handling him because the tears were running down his face. And I said to him, what's wrong with you? He said, it's my sin. It's my sin. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. That a person recognizes their sinnership before Almighty God, that they are guilty. And not only is it a troubling influence by the Holy Spirit, but the character we read about tonight in the Bible, it says that he came trembling. Trembling. I have on occasions witnessed people trembling after preaching. I can remember occasions when people sat beside me in the counseling room and apologized because their body was shaking like that there just because God was dealing with them. Oh, that 
God would work again in our land and that many men and women would tremble under the law of God and under the reality that there is a God to meet and an eternity to face and a hell that we need to shun and run from. Trembling. Do you know what the psalmist said, my friends? And I'm coming to the close. Do you know what the psalmist said? The psalmist said, The sorrows of death compassed me. The pains of hell got hold upon me. I found trouble and sorrow. Then called I on the name of the Lord. O Lord, I beseech thee, deliver my soul. I remember Mary Peckham. Mary Morrison was her name. She was converted in the Lewis Revival. And she ministered for many years with the late Duncan Campbell, who was used in the Lewis Revival. And she, her husband was the principal of our Bible college, and she used to come and lecture. And we got to know her later on after the college personally as a friend. And she often related, she said, whenever the power of God was on the islands and conviction of sin was on the community and men and women were afraid of God and afraid of his judgment and aware of their sin, she said, many times I sat in church and I felt the flames of hell lick round my soul. I felt the flames of hell lick round my soul. Is it any wonder when she got converted that she became a bright burning light for the master until the day he called her home? She knew she was lost and thank God she was found. You see, my dear friends, God shows us where we are. But then there has to be a conversion. There has to be a new birth. There has to be born again. It has to happen. Jesus said, except a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of heaven. And I want to name, in coming to a close, just a few people who were encountered the Holy Spirit, encountered Jesus, and were made aware of their sin and what happened in their lives. And the first one, my friend, was a man who abandoned religion and abandoned the church and abandoned all the creeds and laws of the church. He was called Nicodemus. He was the equivalent of an archbishop. But he knew that all the religion of the day couldn't get him to heaven. He didn't have peace with God, but he had heard and met this man, Jesus, and he knew that he was sent from God. And so secretly at night, afraid of his colleagues, he went to meet Jesus, and Jesus said, Nicodemus, you might be a high flyer in the church, and you might have your color, and you might have your staff, and you might have all the trappings of religion, and you might have all your credentials from your college, but unless you're born again, you'll never see the kingdom. And our country tonight, sadly, is coming down with multitudes of clergy, men in their pulpits, with all their degrees and all the things colleges have given them. And they know nothing of the life of God. They know nothing of the power of the Holy Spirit. They know nothing of being born again, but are blind leaders of the blind, leading their people into the pit and following them down to the depths of hell. He abandoned religion. And my dear friends, I wasn't that religious, but I was religious before I got saved. But 40 years ago in a tent campaign in Kiliman, not far from here, I remember the night when I met Jesus. And Jesus came into my life and my heart, and he transformed me. And I abandoned religion that night. I abandoned it. 
I have no trust in creeds or religions or doing good or going helping people. I don't depend on any of that. That's no good. I'm depending on what Jesus did for me on the cross when God punished him for the sins of the world, that he took my sin on his own body on the tree, that he was wounded for my transgressions, bruised for my iniquities. The chastisement of my peace was on him and by his stripes I am healed. My dear friends, I could have sang happy day, happy day when Jesus washed my sins away. And when I get to heaven, which I will one day, it'll not be because of anything I've done. It'll not be because of any sermon I've preached or any helping of anybody I have done. It'll be nothing to do with any good works or baptism or anything at all. The only reason I'll enter those pearly gates and meet loved ones and go into the city where the roses never fade and walk down those streets of gold, the only reason that I'll be there is because Jesus died for me. That's the only reason. He died for me. And he rose for me. My dear friends, that man give up religion. The dying thief, as he was dying, he called out to the Lord and he said, Lord, remember me. And my friend, that night, that day as he died on the cross, he abandoned terrorism. He was a terrorist. And God knows we have had our share of them. But had he got down from the cross, he wouldn't have been celebrating any of his crimes. He wouldn't have been eulogizing the other boy on the cross. He would have been a follower of Christ. And he would have said, I have given up the devil's ways. I'm not a murderer anymore. I haven't been involved in killing people. And I'm not celebrating it anymore because I've met Jesus. I've abandoned terrorism. That's what needs to happen. And when Jesus saves terrorists, they give it up. And they say, that's the devil's way. I'm not in for that. And I say that, my friends, to those who listen, not just people who are so-called Roman Catholic terrorists, but Protestant terrorists as well. Zacchaeus climbed the tree and met the Savior, and when he met him, he came out, my dear friends. He gave up corruption and lying and cheating and the love of money and avarice. He gave it up because he met Christ. He was converted. You remember the wee girl in Philippi and Paul met her on his way to the prayer meeting and she was full of demons. She was full of devils. And Paul met her and he cast the devils out of her and she came to Christ and she became a part of the early church in Philippi. And my friend, she gave up the occult. She gave up the new age. She gave up the devil's practices. She didn't use them anymore for her for power to do things. She gave that up. She abandoned it because she had come to Christ. Oh, we could go on and on, couldn't we? We could go on and on. But listen, friends. The Bible says about this man, and I'm closing. He said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? The Bible says it shall come to pass that whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Thank God it doesn't say come to the front because if you were a cripple, you couldn't come. Thank God it doesn't say you have to put your hand up to get saved because if you didn't have hands, what state would you be in? Thank God God has made it as easy as he possibly can. He said, if you call, just cry from your heart to me. He knows you. He's with you. He's beside you. He knows all about you. He's willing and longing to forgive you. Just come. To him as a sinner. And say, Lord, have mercy on me. Please save me. And make me a child of God. You know, friends, in closing, I remember reading the story of a man whose son was with him. And they were walking across and the wind caught the little boy at the edge of a cliff. And the wee boy went into the water and down to the edge of the sea. The father instinctively jumped in after him and caught the wee boy. And while the waves were coming round them, he clambered up and got hold of a cliff edge and the father held him. But he couldn't get up any further. And the water started coming in as the tide came up. 
And they started hitting round the Father and he knew that they couldn't be saved if the tide came in. And so he looked up and there was a little edge above him. And he took his little boy and he pushed him up and he said, Son, hold on tight. Hold on tight. The father knew he couldn't get up with him. There wasn't room. But he told the boy to hold on tight. And as the time went on and the tide came in, one of the waves hit the father and took him out to sea. The little boy was rescued, but the father gave his life. My friends, God came into the sea of sin where you and I were drowning. And God in his mercy came and he lifted you and me up and he wants to put us on the ledge. And when Jesus was on the cross, my friend, he endured all the storms and the wrath of sin and all the judgment on sin. He took it in his own body on the tree so that you could be forgiven, so that I could be forgiven, that we could be in heaven, that we could be saved. Are you saved tonight? Are you saved? I want to encourage you now to be saved. If the Holy Spirit is convicting you of your sin, I want you to follow me in a prayer. We're going to bow our heads. All bow our heads, every Christian pray. If tonight you say, Alan, that is me. I know there's a voice in me beyond the voice of you. And I know like that man gave his testimony earlier on tonight. I know that God is dealing with me. And Alan, I would give an arm and a leg tonight to be saved. I would give my life to be saved, to know that I'll be in heaven. I'm willing to do anything to be saved. Well, my friend, you don't have to do anything. You have to come to Christ. And so I want to help you. And if that's you tonight, I want you to pray after me. The prayer won't save you. It's Jesus who will save you. But if you mean it with all your heart, God will make it real. Say after me to God, Lord Jesus, I realize I'm a sinner. I have broken your law. I am guilty. I need your forgiveness. I come to you now. I repent for all my sin. I open the door of my life to you. Come in, Lord Jesus, and save me now. Thank you, Jesus, for coming in and saving me. Help me now to tell others what you have done for me. Help me to live for you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen.